So there are two things that I love. One is the home lab, a space where you can actually go and build your own environment for your own learning, for your own home space. Maybe you wanna have a network set up at home. And then when you go into work, maybe you work in technology, you can actually put some of those skills to practice. And the second thing that I love is virtual machines and combining these things together is brilliant. Virtual machines, of course, the olden ways of doing physical computers are now gone. And now you virtualize everything. You virtualize the servers, you virtualize applications. Everything is now running in virtual environments. My name is Emilio. I love tech and hopefully you do too. We release videos every single week on all things tech. And today, 10 things, 10 things that you can actually do with virtual machines. What sort of servers, what virtual machines you can actually build in your home lab or really anywhere. I love running VMware locally on-premise, but I also love running VMware on the cloud. One of my favorite cloud providers is a private hosting company called Liquid Web. And because it is a private cloud, it's fully managed. They take care of everything else. So all the cloud infrastructure, all of the operating systems, the services, you just look after your VMs themselves. They're also VMware professional solution provider partners. And all of their cloud solutions are VMware cloud verified. So check out the description of this video to actually get a link so you can sign up to Liquid Web. So of course, in a corporate environment, you've got physical servers, right? You've got a server racks, server cabinets, you've got data centers that are full of routers, switches, storage units like SANs and NASs, and then you've got servers, physical big pieces of infrastructure that are deemed as servers. But the reality is that any form of computer, any virtual machine can essentially be converted into a server if it's servicing something. What we're gonna be talking about when we're talking about servers. So if you've got some files on a computer and people in your home access that computer for specific things. Well, in a way, that computer is sort of acting like a server. It doesn't have to actually be sitting on a big computer, running on a laptop, running some server software, and then that laptop is sort of acting like a server. So before we even start talking about what I'm gonna be doing from a virtual server perspective, you've got to think about the underlying operating system. Of course, any server can have a different operating system running on it. You could have Windows Server running on it with some server software, and that physical computer, a desktop, a laptop running Windows Server is acting like a server because it's now running server software onto it. You've got Linux, there's lots of different flavors of Linux available. You've got Ubuntu, Ubuntu has a server edition. CentOS has a server edition. If you wanna get into virtualization, well then you're talking about technology such as VMware. VMware has this software called ESXi, which is essentially a operating system that converts your computer into a hypervisor, into a server. You've also got Citrix. Microsoft have their own version as well called Hyper-V, where you can actually install Windows Server onto a computer and then commission that server as a Hyper-V server. So you really got to have a think about it, that anything that you're going to be building is going to, of course, have the underlying server technology running onto it to then be able to service something. Now, in some cases, they'll tell you a specific software that you can actually be running, but we're not gonna cover how to actually do that. We're gonna be summarizing all of the things that you could be building, but then you go away and actually go and research it yourself. The best, best, best way that I learn is to actually go and do it myself. Let's now start with number one and we'll work our way up. A spot to actually manage all of your files. And yeah, you may already have something like this. You've maybe already got a computer that has a whole bunch of files on there. If you're running Windows Server, for example, you can actually add some file service services, roles and services and features on that computer. You can take advantage of things such as SMB and KIF shares. You can take advantage of maybe NFS. You can set up security groups to actually allow only certain files to be shared with only certain types of people. If you wanna get really fancy, you can go and build yourself a NAS, install some free software onto your computer and convert it into a NAS. True NAS is one of my favorites. You can go check that out, go and install it, go and play around with it, and you can convert it as a NAS. And then essentially you make this server accessible out on the network and centrally manage them in one spot. You can sort of split this next one up into two different things, but we're here talking about a firewall and a proxy. A firewall, of course, well, you have a physical firewall potentially sometimes on a router. If you've got a home router, it's probably got some sort of a firewall built into it or a modem. You may have your own separate firewall, a physical appliance, a physical hardware uh, that is running as a firewall. Great, and a lot of companies will do that. But you can also get software-based firewalls. So you can build a server 
as a firewall. You could also build a proxy. Well, what's a proxy? So essentially a proxy server acts as a bridge between a host server and a client server. Essentially sends data from a website to your computer's IP address and it passes through this proxy server. So only specific access is allowed in or out. You could do authentication and things of that nature. One that I love is PFSense. Go and check it out. Download it completely for free and you can set up a proxy and a firewall. And you know what? This is something that is awesome. If, you, if you're wanting to know more about networking, if you want to know more about routes, you want to know about firewall rules, try PFSense, get it. Now the core essential piece that every single business to some extent will have, at least if they've got servers, we'll say, is they're going to be having some sort of a domain set up on what's called a domain controller. So you need to go and build yourself a domain controller running Windows Server on your computer. So you can install Windows Server 2022 as a VM on that computer and then go and build and promote that server into a domain controller. And then you're essentially going to get Active Directory set up on that domain controller. And then the domain controller essentially becomes the manager for your entire domain. And then of course in Active Directory, go and configure all of the OUs, the organizational units. You can build your users, your computers, security groups, all of that. Little plug for my training course down below. I've got a link to a full course there around Windows Server. I've got links around Windows administration in general computer network basics, all of that. So go and check that out. All my courses, we go into a lot more detail around AD and domains. Then move into DNS. Now DNS is something that is sort of essential uh, to really get resolution of names within a business or within computer to IP, a host name to an IP. So what are we talking about when we're talking about DNS? Well, if you go to www.emilioaguero.net, which is my website in the background, resolves to an IP address. An IP address, wouldn't that be annoying if you had to remember all these IP addresses? Well, you don't have to do that because DNS does the translation for you. In a work environment, in a home lab environment, you essentially do the same thing. And you can actually build your own DNS server. Again, you could use Windows Server. You could have this running on a domain controller. You could have a standalone DNS server. You could even build a DNS server on a Linux box that actually manages the DNS records between all of your devices. A monitoring server, a server that you can monitor all of your servers. You can actually monitor traffic coming in, traffic coming out, see things going a little bit odd. Like if one of your virtual servers is running a little bit too hot or it's shut down, wouldn't it be nice for you to be alerted when something like that happens? You can actually manage all of this monitoring using lots of different awesome platforms. A few that I love, you can try them for free as well. PRTG and Zabbix, set them up in your environment so you can actually get a good snapshot on what's going on in your home lab. So how do computers on a network get their IP address? Like you're plugging in a computer into a network and it automatically just gets a 192.168.0.3 IP address. How does it do that? Well, there's two ways. One is a static IP, somebody physically going in and putting in the IP address. The other way is DHCP. Somebody actually going and setting up a DHCP server and then it's dishing out IP addresses across your network. So go and build yourself your own DHCP server. A few things that you could do here, you could actually go and actually do this on a Windows server as well. Build your own dedicated Windows box, a VM running DHCP. Again, you can also do this on a Linux box. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually run your own website in your home lab? At least learn about the technology. And yes, you can by building a web server. One of the most popular CMS, essentially a full platform for websites is a program called WordPress. You can install WordPress completely for free. It'll install all the backend stuff like PHP, MySQL, like the database and all of that in the background. And understanding a little bit about WordPress is actually gonna be one extra little thing that you could have on your CV. And because it is one of the largest web platforms out there, you having those skills will put you a little bit more in high demand. So go and play around with WordPress on a web server. Next is a database server. Database servers are one of those things that you really need to know a little bit about because applications, web servers are all gonna be talking to some sort of a database server. If you've gone and deployed a very, very big product out in a company, chances are it's gonna be getting information or at least it's gonna be storing stuff in some sort of a database. There's the big guys, you've got Microsoft SQL, you've also got Oracle and there are others, but you can also go and try MySQL by yourself for free. So if you're gonna build yourself perhaps a web server or you're gonna build yourself a monitoring server or an application server or something like that, rather than having 
for example, WordPress install its own database on its own on the same server, why don't you have WordPress talking to a different server, a different database server, and get that connection between the web and the database by having them on two different boxes. You've got TV shows, you've got maybe some movies, you go on a trip somewhere, a vacation, on a holiday, and you've recorded a whole bunch of videos on there. We can centrally manage all of this on a media server, a dedicated machine for managing all of your content. And the great thing is there's applications such as Plex, which I absolutely love. You can set up Plex, you can scan all of your files and download all the cover art of your TV shows and things like that if you really want to. It's really, really cool. And then you can literally go and grab maybe an iPhone, an iPad, another sort of device, an Apple TV. It finds a Plex server out on the network it'll talk to it. So it's really, really cool media server. You probably use Gmail, you probably use Yahoo, Hotmail. Hotmail is so old. What if you could run your own email server at home? And the great news is that you can actually do that in your home lab. A lot of companies, most big corporates are gonna use some sort of a mail server, something like Exchange. You can get Exchange out on the cloud, right? If you have Microsoft 365, you can actually get an Exchange environment spun up that way. But there's a lot of companies that are using Exchange on-premise exchange as an actual server. So you can go and download Microsoft Exchange for free to be able to trial it for 180 days off the Microsoft website. And then you build a VM as an exchange server. You go and set it up as a mail server and then actually manage emails directly from your own VM. Let me know which ones you're gonna wanna go try down below in the comments and stay tuned for the next video where we continue talking about tech. Right now, we're talking more about the home lab. We'll see you then.